Today's video mini lecture is on autocorrelation and how to calculate it using a formula and using SPSS. Autocorrelation occurs in a time series study when a variable measured at one point in time exerts an influence on the same variable at other points in time. I'll give you a couple of examples. So for the first example, imagine that you measure a person's mood every day for 30 days. And the day one mood index measurement that you have is going to likely have an impact on the day two mood index. That is to say that uh, if a person is feeling rather poorly on day one, when you see them in therapy, chances are on day two, you will not see a dramatic change, but rather day two's measurement will be fairly close to day one. The day one measurement should be less close to day 10, which is to say that by day 10, you'll see a lot more variability. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about autocorrelation, that a variable uh, is correlated with itself uh, in a lag time series uh, aspect when it exerts an influence on successive measurement in points in time. So if you have uh, information about day one, that should give a fairly decent approximation of the uh, status of the person at day two. And day two in turn would give a fairly decent uh, prediction of day three. Here's another example outside of psychology. Uh, the price of a public stock, we're talking equities traded on the market. Uh, the price of a public stock on day one will likely be close to the price on day two, but less so by day 10. Uh, and if this is the case, then the uh, values are said to have serial dependence. And this is actually a good thing uh, for stock traders, because if you have information about the time series and who doesn't, uh, if you're looking at the stocks on the market, uh, then you can uh, get a pretty decent judge from one day to the next of how much change to expect. Of course, the caveat there is that you're going to have things like quarterly reports and other financial uh, issues that hit the company in a positive or negative manner uh, that can cause drastic changes in the stock price and on any given day. And it's the same thing in, in therapy as well. If you have uh, something particularly good or bad happen to your client, then you'll, you'll see a, a large shift or jump uh, in the measurement that you're taking on the person's mood. Now let's talk about the calculation of the autocorrelation by formula. Here are two sources, uh, two book chapters, the first by Gorman and Allison, uh, who've written extensively about uh, issues in um, single case subject design, and the second one by McCleary and Welsh. Uh, these are two uh, well-known edited texts on single case design research. And both of these uh, articles give different formulas for the autocorrelation. Whenever I deal with a statistic, I like to be able to calculate it by hand so that I can see what it's doing. And in that sense, I get a more intuitive grasp of the nature of what it is that I'm uh, working with. And so for both of these different articles, these uh, book chapters, they each have different formulas, and neither of them actually match what SPSS does. At least I could not get them to work properly. So I developed my own formula, and here it is. This is sort of a mix of the formulas that you see in Gorman and Allison's chapter and McLaren and Welsh's chapter. Doesn't It's not an exact match for either of them. Uh, it's a little bit different, but it works it in, in the sense that it matches what SPSS does. Um, I should also mention that I've seen other formulas other than the two that are provided by Gorman and Allison and McLaren Welsh, and those ones also don't seem to work properly. So I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of at a loss, and I struggled with this issue for a few days before I settled on making my own formula, uh, but my own formula actually works. Um, Here's some definitions for the formula. R sub 1 is the lag 1 uh, correlation or autocorrelation. N is the number of measures in your single subject design. Uh, 
y sub k plus 1 is the lag plus 1 deviation score. Uh, I'll have a set of data and I'll show you how to do this. So here you see a set of data. The dependent variable is y. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 measures on y. The mean of these values is 5. In order to uh, produce the different parts of the formula, what we need to do is fill in all these columns. Uh, y minus the mean of y is the deviation score of y. And you can see how far each one of these values is deviating from its mean. And then for the next one, this is, it's the same column, but here's the lag. So that first position where there's a dash, we don't actually use that. That's what happens when you do a, a um, autocorrelation uh, based on a specific lag. If it was lag one, you're going to miss one pair. If it's lag two, you're going to miss two pairs. I'm only doing lag one, which is the most commonly reported autocorrelation type. But you can see that these values here, negative two, negative two, negative one, etc., are the same values that you have in the deviation score column of y minus the mean of y, negative two, negative two, negative one, etc. You just push it down one position, and that's the lag. Now for the next column, what we do is we take the product of these. Of course, we're going to skip the one that has a dash because that one's not going to be counted. So negative two minus negative two gives us positive four. Negative one times negative two gives us positive two, etc. This is the product of the deviation scores of y minus the mean y times the lagged deviation score of y minus the mean of y. And you get the sum of that. We're going to use that in the formula. And then we also need just the straightforward sum of squares for variable y. And it's y minus the mean of y squared. So that's negative 2 squared is 4, negative 2 squared is 4, negative 1 squared is 1, etc. So that's where these numbers come from. Those sum up to 16. Now let's fill in the formula. So you can see that I've done the work already. Uh, the sample size, or let's say the number of observations rather than sample size because it's an N of 1 study. The sample size is 8, or um, the, I'm so used to saying sample size. The number of measurements is 8, so it's 1 over 8. That's what you have over here. And then we just take the values from these two uh, end columns of our table of calculations and put them in here. When you calculate it out, you get 0 0.625. That's the lag one autocorrelation. Now you can think of autocorrelation in the same metric as correlation. It can be as high as positive one, as low as negative one. Uh, and uh, ignoring the, so the, ignoring the uh, sign, uh, higher scores indicate uh, more autocorrelation. And this can be a bad thing. So there's the autocorrelation value, and uh, I'll show you how to get it from SPSS. Let me first show you the output for this data set. So just looking at variable y, and I get the um, output from SPSS. It tells me the different lag correlations, and we're only interested here in the lag 1 autocorrelation, and you see that that number matches our, our calculation of 0.625. Here's a, a, a data set from SPSS that I created, and I've got two different dependent variables, one that I called high auto and one that I called low auto. And I'll show you how to do this in SPSS uh, coming up next. But first, let me just uh, point out that the high auto, these numbers are sequential. It, I mean, they go up one unit increment each time, so we would expect a very high autocorrelation for these numbers. For the low autocorrelation, it's the same set of values, 1 through 10, for the first uh, set. I've just jumbled them up more or less randomly. And you can see that I've got 10 in uh, phase 1, 10 in phase 2, where phase 1 would be baseline and phase 2 would be treatment phase. Uh, same thing for the uh, treatment phase, the second set of 10 numbers, it goes 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, etc., but I've just sort of jumbled them up, uh, I guess I'd say se semi-randomly, because I did this by hand. I did not use a random number generator. And I've got SPSS open. Let me navigate over to 
SPSS. And here you can see the file set up. Uh, and in order to get the autocorrelation, it's a very simple procedure. Just go to Analyze, Forecasting. In psychology, we don't use the forecasting um, options uh, set very often. I think it's more often used in, uh, in financial prediction making. But here's your, here's your option for autocorrelations. And I'm going to take each one of these, high and low. We don't need the phase. I'm also not going to look at the partial correlation, so I'm going to unselect that. Under options, there's really nothing extra that we need. And I hit OK. So it's going to do these one at a time. Uh, first, the high autocorrelation, you can see right here, the high autocorrelation has a value of 0.85. And for the low autocorrelation data set, it's 0.485. So again, it's, it's a very simple procedure. When you set up the data, you can do it with a single column of data. It doesn't have to be anything more than that. Uh, go to Forecast, Autocorrelations, and just pick whichever variable you want, pull it over, and run it. And there you have the autocorrelation. Okay, now going back to uh, PowerPoint. So here's what the high autocorrelation uh, set of scores looks like when I plug them into Excel to get what would normally be a, a more or less standard uh, baseline treatment phase uh, chart for a single subject design study. And you can see that the autocorrelation is very high, it's 0.85. And this is the second simulated data set with a low autocorrelation. Uh, the means of the baseline and, and treatment phases are actually identical. There's no change there in the means, but you can see that there is no uh, essence of a sequential pattern. Also, in both cases, if you calculated the P and D, uh, it would be 100%. Uh, but uh, there's a much more clear evidence of treatment effect in the low autocorrelation series than there is in the high autocorrelation series. In the high autocorrelation series here, I mean, it's just a linear trend, perfect linear trend that goes up. And if you don't think that autocorrelation is something that you should be looking at when you do single subject design research, uh, just read this recent article uh, by Manilov and Solanas, 2008 in Behavior Modification. Uh, what they did is they tested autocorrelation effects under a number of different parameters that they manipulated artificially. I won't go into the full details. If you're interested, you should read their study. Uh, but let me just point out that some of the common um, indexes of effect size, uh, the, I don't recall exactly what the Allison and Gorman index is. I have to go back and look. The DAB is the uh, Cohen's D. Uh, and Cohen's D is often reported, and it should not be, uh, for single subject design research. In my opinion, uh, the Cohen's D has no place whatsoever uh, in this type of work. But you can see here, uh, where autocorrelation spans the range from a uh, negative 0.9 to a positive 0.9, that in the mid-range, you would have a Cohen's D, actually the triangles, triangles down here, a Cohen's D that's fairly small. Uh, and as the autocorrelation goes up, and I think it's more common to see a positive autocorrelation like this, you start to have a dramatic increase in the uh, estimate of the effect size measured by Cohen's D. And I've seen that in, in, you know, in, in person that uh, when people calculate the Cohen's D effect size for phase change from uh, treatment uh, from a baseline to treatment phase, you get these incredibly large Cohen's Ds that seem to have no uh, resemblance to the Cohen's D that people are uh, used to seeing in, in uh, group-based research. So my advice is not to use Cohen's D. Uh, in single subject design research, you should measure the autocorrelation. It's easy to do. You don't have to do it by formula. In fact, the formula is kind of 
a beast to, to work with because uh, there's so many different uh, versions of the formula published in books. And a lot of college uh, stats textbooks don't even give you a formula. Like the Andy Field, uh, very popular uh, stats textbook, he's got a nice section where he describes what an autocorrelation is and how it can have a negative impact on your research, uh, but he doesn't even give a formula for it. So I hope this has been useful and um, keep in mind as you do single subject research that uh, autocorrelation can have a dramatic effect on your, uh, your data. Uh, even the PND as shown in this article, not on this table, but uh, Manilov and Solanas uh, were able to show that the PND statistic is affected by uh, autocorrelation as well. So it should be reported along with anything else that you report about your stats. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, see you next time.